Well, it's six o'clock. Is Chloe on? Because I know she was going to make some uh, comments about how to join the meeting before. Oh, are you guys in chambers together? We I'm are. Here, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Anyone? Everyone okay. good? For I'm going to go ahead and broadcast then, Katie. Okay. Perfect. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, before we call the meeting to, uh, to order, I'm going to turn it over to staff uh, for Chloe to give a couple comments about how to join tonight's meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Hello, and welcome to the special city council meeting. In accordance with the current Santa Cruz County Health Order and the Governor's Executive Order N-2920, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and will be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Our technician tonight is Kingston Rivera. Thank you, Kingston. If you are watching our community on community TV and would instead prefer to join the Zoom webinar, please visit the City of Capitola homepage and click on City Council Meeting under Upcoming Events, as you see on the screen. As a webinar attendee, your microphone is muted for the entire meeting unless you request to be unmuted during the public comment period. You do not need a microphone, camera, screen, or computer. If you only want to listen to the meeting, the meeting is accessible by landline or mobile phone. To join the webinar using a telephone only, dial any of the following numbers shown on the screen. The webinar ID is also provided. Remember that the mayor will announce the public comment period. There are several ways to make a comment. If you are a Zoom webinar attendee, simply click raise your hand and wait to be unmuted by the moderator. If you've called into Zoom over the phone, dial star nine to raise your hand and wait to be unmuted. To email a comment, send your email to the address shown on the screen. One comment verbally or by email per person is allowed. If you send more than one email about the same item, the last received will be read or displayed. Comments received outside the public comment period will not be included in the record. Thank you for attending the meeting and Mayor Peterson, thank you, um, I'll turn this over to you. Great, thank you so much. All right, we're gonna call tonight's meeting to order. Can we have a roll call please? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botorf. Here. Councilmember Story. Here. Vice Mayor Brooks. Here. Mayor Peterson. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any additional materials for tonight's meeting? We do not have any additional materials. Great, thank you. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are no additions or deletions to the agenda this evening. Great, thank you. We're going to move on to city council and staff comments. We'll start with staff. Are there any staff members that have comments this evening? No comments. Great, thank you. Uh, then we'll go to council members. Any council members that have any uh, comments? Go ahead and uh, use the raise hand feature. Council member story. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to report out from our last Arts Commission meeting um, and just let everyone know that the Arts Commission did officially take action to cancel uh, next um, uh, end of October's plein air um, artist uh, event that we normally hold in Capitola. So um, I'll just say look for that to come back in 2021. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, any additional council comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to general government public hearings. 
Uh, and tonight's only item on the agenda is uh, to continue discussion of zoning code items. So I will turn it over to staff for a staff report. Okay, good evening, Mayor Peterson and Council. Um, I hope you're all doing well. This evening we are going to be talking about the zoning code update. As you know, we've been working on this uh, for some time and have been working closely with the Coastal Commission staff over the last year. Uh, this will likely be our last zoning code update meeting prior to uh, publishing a full update for public review comment period and then adoption hearings. So good news. We're kind of on that final, almost to the final step. So as you know, in 2018, we adopted a new zoning code. It took effect immediately outside of the coastal zone. In all areas inside the coastal zone, the zoning code does not take effect until it has been certified by the, coastal, the California Coastal Commission. Um, where we are in the process, currently um, the City Council adopted the code. The Coastal Commission provide us, provided us red lines. That was in November of 2018. In March of 2019, the Planning Commission provided a recommendation on, this, on the Coastal Commission red lines. And since that time, uh, we've been working diligently with the Coastal Commission at the direction of City Council to uh, find common ground. Um, and the current step is for City Council review and recommendation. Following this step, we'll be publishing a final draft for adoption hearings. We'll put that out for public review and come back to the Planning Commission for a recommendation and then City Council for adoption. Fo following City Council adoption, we will put together a packet for the um, California Coastal Commission. We'll submit the zoning code update, which is referred to your local coastal program implementation plan to the Coastal Commission for adoption. It will get scheduled for a hearing. And what I'm hearing from the Coastal Commission is that because they've done so much work on this up front, they expect to get us uh, scheduled with, for a hearing within 90 days of acceptance. Um, if it is approved, then it would be certified. They have provided us with all the red lines that they expect to provide during our submittal process. So if we were to have accepted all of their red lines, um, we would have almost been guaranteed a certified approval. At this point, we're just going through some of the items that they had given back to us and trying to find common ground. Um, so when we do submit, um, they could approve that if they approve, they'll either approve it and certify it or approve it contingent to us adopting their red lines. So if we accept the red lines that they provide, it becomes certified. If we choose not to adopt their red lines but propose new revisions, we would start over. We would um, have a public hearings and then we would submit it back to the Coastal Commission for their review and see if we can get to the place of approval and certification. If um, we didn't accept their red lines and we chose not to take any further action, then we would the submittal would lapse and we would have two separate codes. Before I continue, any questions on the process? Seeing none, I'll move forward. Uh, Katie? Yes? I just want to let you know your presentation isn't on Zoom, it's your camera. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Can you see this? Yes. Hold on. Okay, can you see the screen with the adoption and certification process? Yeah. Yes, okay. So any questions on the certification process? Okay, seeing no hands, we'll move forward. Um, so the, hmm. there we go. So our first topic tonight is the Monarch Cove Inn. Um, oh, uh, yes? I think Council Member Story has his hand up. He's Council Member Story, you're still on mute. There you go. I did. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to disclose that I have a, a property interest within 500 feet of this project, so I'm going to refuse myself. Um, 
and step out virtually. I'll, I'll come back when you're done with this item. Okay, and I should clarify that we're going to uh, review three topics tonight. And at the end of each topic, I'll be asking for direction before we move on to the next topic. Okay. Okay, so with that, um, so we'll talk about the Monarch Cove Inn. The Monarch Cove Inn is located on Depot Hill at the very end of Escalona Drive and El Salto Drive. Um, and historically, this property, at first it was utilized as a single family home and then it was modified to a bed and breakfast in which the current owner has lived and worked at for many decades and run. Um, and this zoning code update change was due to the, the current owner would like to retire and no longer operate the bed and breakfast as a bed and breakfast, but would like to operate it as a single family home. Um, within our land use plan, which sets the long term, the long range planning goals within your coastal areas, um, this property is identified and within the maps it's identified um, with the pedestrian and bicycle accesses to and along the shoreline the property is identified as a viewpoint as having a view and then it, it talks about the other pedestrian accesses along the bluff um, currently how this property is utilized there's an, on the parcel that's labeled number one there's an office with a carport and a one-bedroom cottage the parcel number two which is right-of-way that was dedicated to the owners um, is it has a two-bedroom cottage and then the bed and breakfast sits on parcel three which is an 11 bedroom um, bed and breakfast under the existing zoning code um, the requirement for this property is that residential uses by the owners and their family members the current standard to do residential use requires that the owner and their family members of up to one unit per parcel can be used as residential on the three parcels as long as a minimum of six guest bedrooms are available for visitors serving uses within the three parcels so that's the current standard so it it requires a little less than half of the bedrooms on site to always be utilized as n uh, nightly rental for visitor serving. Within our 2018 adopted code, we move forward with a, a zoning change on this property, zoning it before it was visitor serving. We changed it to visitor serving um, overlay with a R1 single family zoning as the base zone and Within the land use table, we, um, the, the first draft was that single family dwellings require a conditional use permit and shall comply with all the standards of the R1 district. When we submitted this to the Coastal Commission staff, they changed our note within the land use table and said single family dwelling is only allowed if ancillary to visitor accommodating uses. So that would say it has to be secondary to visitor accommodating uses. So within that, we would. Um, it would suggest that probably seven of the rooms would have to be utilized as visitors, visitor accommodations. Um, and the Planning Commission, when they reviewed this last year, they added, they modified the note to say that single family dwellings, you know, it, it requires a conditional use permit, but it would be allowed in conjunction with visitor accommodation uses use or a grant of a public access to a viewpoint um, so in looking at this the actually I'm going to first bring you to um, we did receive a proposal that was in your packet from the owners of the Monarch Coven I just want to let you know that what you're seeing tonight if if a single family use were to come forward and this note were to exist in the future code all details of a proposed viewpoint would be worked out then. It would not be worked out during the zoning code update. It's just stating that um, the way it's drafted is that a viewpoint would be provided by the owner. So the Planning Commission and City Council in reviewing, the Planning Commission, I guess, in reviewing their conditional use permit would take a really thorough look at this. But this is actually a good practice just so to get the vision of what a viewpoint could be in the future. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you're seeing a photo of the existing pathway, and that is within, um, 
it's a, a piece of land not it was dedicated to the city but we never accepted the dedication so it's still owned by the original um, map um, the pr person that originally owned the property and it goes way back to 1888 um, however the parcel that's outlined in red is owned by the Blodgett family that owns the depot, uh, I'm sorry, the Monarch Cove Inn, and they're showing on there a corner in which they would propose uh, the viewpoint dedication. So the pathway would lead to the dedication. And here they've provided a photo of where that view is and um, a site plan. And then just a conceptual uh, picture of what that could look like when spruced up with some benches. Um, so with that, uh, staff is recommending that the council provide direction on requirements for the single family use at the Monarch Cove Inn. Um, specifically, does the council support the Planning Commission recommendation to allow an alternative to visitor accommodations through a grant of public access to a viewpoint? Also, are there um, other visitor serving uses the city should propose to Coastal Commission as a compromise to allow single family. Um, with that, I'll take any council questions prior to going into public hearing. Great, thank you. I see uh, Council Member Bertrand has his hand up. So, um, in terms of the right of way, that's not quite certain yet if. If it was determined that we didn't have access to that right of way and there was a public viewing place, um, then we'd have to go across the Blodgett's land. Could that be arranged in some sort of agreement in the future? The, the way that the uh, condition is written in, it could be arranged in the future if, if that access were not available. My understanding, though, is okay. that existing access just hasn't been accepted by the city at this point, but it has been offered. Okay, so even that offering was so long ago, we can still accept it. But who are we going to accept it from? That's an issue. So we would need to work out all those logistics at the time of the review of the application. But if if not, if if that were not still being, my understanding is the offer still stands um, from the prior okay. review of the proposed hotel expansion on the site. But. Um. Uh, in terms of the wording of the proposed uh, proposal from city planning, uh, could we also request that there be an Airbnb offering on each side? Yeah, you could. Or, the, the council could give direction tonight for other visitor serving uses or other um, items that they'd like to see incorporated into those conditions. Okay, so there's three units. Could we could we request the the main building to stay visitor serving? And the other two could go to a single family. Is that a possibility? You could propose that tonight, yes. Okay, so we could, the Blotches could have access to single family, do what they want to, two of them, and the historic Monarch Cove could stay as a visitor serving and potentially could also get the viewpoint. Those are possibilities? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Councilmember Bosser also it looks like has a question. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Jacques kind of got close to the questions I was going to ask, uh, but specifically to Katie, I, uh, I kind of didn't get a clear answer on <clears throat> are we going to move forward with, with acquiring that piece of property or is that something that is predicated on something else happening? I, I didn't get a formal answer that we're going to accept, how, how we're going to accept that dedicated property. So in speaking with the public works director about this, my understanding is that the last time our legal staff, which was the previous legal staff, reviewed um, this um, offer of dedication, that the offer still stands because there hasn't been a quiet title that has been exchanged for this property. Um, we would have to work very closely with our city attorney to accept that offer of dedication and make it um, city property. And then we, we would just, within our acceptance, we would be accepting the area of the dedication that is for the trail. It, you, typically you accept the improvements, is my understanding. So 
Um, all the steps that are required within that, we would make sure that would happen if they were to come in with a proposal for a single family home. If it were something that the city council wanted to look at separately than the zoning code, that is something that we could talk about separately of the zoning code. But within what we're proposing for the zoning code, if an, if an application were to come in for the R1, we would move forward. Um, if they came in with an application for a residential with looking at that, um, accepting that offer of dedication. Okay, thank you for that explanation. That's all my question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Hi, yes. Um, Katie, I think I'll, I'll need you to um, not elaborate, but be a little bit more clear about that answer that you gave Councilmember Blossworth. Um, if, if it's a two-part process um, where we need to include some language in this for uh, first, and then we follow up on it. And then my second question is, um, I couldn't, I didn't really hear if there were any other viewpoints um, other than that particular area you showed on the map. So as, um, as presented. So those are my two questions. Okay. Um, so I'll try to be more clear on that. So for an offer, my understanding is that there was an offer of dedication for, I'm gonna pull, um, show the map. So where the existing pathway is here, there was previously an offer of dedication to the city, and that goes back to when the original map for this area of Depot Hill was created. It's still owned by the original owner, um, which we would have to go back and do title searches and find out exactly who has rights to it at this point. But because the offer was made and not accepted, and also because nobody else has taken ownership of it, the offer still stands and the city has the ability to accept that offer. Um, in terms of the proposed, does, is that clear? So, so that can happen within a future application for a residential, um, if the planning commission wanted the viewpoint to be accessed through that pathway that could be done during that review of a single family home on that parcel or that modification from bed and breakfast to single family use. Um, it could also be done separately should the city council choose to to want to own that piece of property um, where the dedicate the offer still stands is my understanding. Um, your second question was, is that the location of the viewpoint dedication or are there other proposed viewpoints? At this point, this is just, this is a viewpoint that the owners of the inn are, have identified. They worked with an architect and they thought this was the best uh, place to have it on the site and I, because it, it's leading from that existing pathway to this area. So it's what they've proposed. If a future application came in, the Planning Commission at the time of reviewing the conditional use permit for the residential use, could, could um, they would evaluate the viewpoint and whether or not that's adequate or if there's a different area that they would want the viewpoint. So, um, and just to be more clear on um, Council Member Batran's question, if, if the existing pathway were not the pathway that the Planning Commission chose, but they say wanted a different pathway to a, a different area of a viewpoint, that would be considered during the Planning Commission conditional use permit as well. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah so I guess my follow-up question, would it be in our best interest to, to examine or possibly say in the language that instead, because I think it says one viewpoint in Planning Commission's proposal, um, you want to go back, oh, I'm blocking it, uh, allow or grant a public access to a viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it would be necessary then to edit instead of to a, to several, I don't, I mean, it, since it sounds like there's just so many options out there and I wouldn't want to Yeah, you could Put it you, in a yeah. yeah. You you could make a um, a change to to one or more viewpoints if you felt that that's something you'd like in the language this evening. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. 
I see that uh, Councilmember Bertrand and Councilmember Vato both have their hands up. Are these new questions or uh, old? Okay, let's start with Councilmember Bertrand. Yeah, so based on your presentation, Katie, I get the impression that on our own, the city of Capitola could request uh, from the owner that um, access, which includes the viewpoint, the potential viewpoint, and the city could acquire it on its own. Is that correct? No. Um, on our own, we could acquire the access, but not the viewpoint. The viewpoint is on okay. the property, the Monarch Cove Inn property. Okay, I thought it's just a follow through of that original access street. No, so this, the red outlined parcel is owned by the Monarch Cove Inn. The okay. portion owned by the, pre, by the subdivider of Depot Hill originally is this parcel out here that has, we've never okay. accepted the Okay, so then the, the inn, whatever the history of the inn is, because it goes back quite a distance, they acquired that extension, the end of that extension. Correct, I think that was part of the Grand Avenue. Right, so they actually acquired that, um, so there must be some deed record of that acquisition. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, any additional questions from council? Seeing none, Katie, so are we bringing it to public comment for each item within this agenda item or, or one public comment period? Um, public comment per item. Per item, okay. All right, so we're now going to open this up to uh, public comment. And uh, do we have our moderator that's going to keep track of that and, and open that up for public comment? Yes, hi. Um, I'm checking right now. Okay, great. We've got planner Sean Sasanto this evening. And I should also mention we have Ben Noble with us this evening who has been the author of the zoning code update and also is available for any questions. Great, thank you so much. Okay, uh, the public comment period is now open. We'll be taking verbal comments first. Uh, please raise your hand or dial star nine if you would like to speak. The timer will be set to three minutes. I'm checking our attendees through Zoom, and I do see one hand raised. It is uh, the Monarch Cove in owner, so I'm going to go ahead and all right. So you've been unmuted, but you will have to say there you go. Okay. Um, am, am I off mute? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, should I start talking? You let me know when. Go ahead. Um, I'm Lana Blodgett, and I'm sitting next to my husband, Robert, and Bob and Colin. And we came forth today to help move this forward. So first of all, thank you, Mayor and City Council, for taking this on your lap, and we really appreciate what you're doing. And we would like to thank you for the opportunity to present our solution to the proposal given by the Capitola Planning Commission which will reestablish our original zoning back to R1 slash visitor serving. In 2014, we put together an expansion project called the Monarch Cove Inn Hotel Project. And it, the residents of Depot Hill did not support our efforts. It was very clear during that time what our neighbors did, did not want this expansion. This inability to expand, though, created a real hardship in that it created an endless cycle of being caretakers for a property that demands a very high maintenance profile while not having enough rooms to financially support that demand. Bob and I, respectively, are 72 and 77, and we must soon retire. We suffer from serious health issues and we will have to close the inn. It is our heartfelt desire to once again use our property to enjoy as a residence for ourselves and our family, as it has been historically for over 60 years. We strongly feel that the goals of the California Coastal Commission in maintaining public access to our coastline is an important issue 
for now and in the future. But to impose a visitor serving zoning surrounded by single family residences creates many potential issues. This is a zoning issue that we've struggled with since its inception in 2004. We now feel that the Capitola Planning Commission has come to a solution to this dilemma. It addresses giving public access to maintain the obligations to the Coastal Commission. In fact, this solution absolves the issue completely. It allows public access to the viewing of the coastline with a dedicated parcel. We will dedicate a parcel to the public as a view overlook. In our dedication of this parcel, a beautiful overlook and walking path will be created for visitors and citizens of Capitola for many years to come. We again thank the city for their recognition and support of this proposal and recognize the value of what this solution will provide and the benefits it will be to move this plan forward. And please recognize again that because of our age, because of serious health issues, we do have to retire. We have to close the end. And we'll be here for questions. Would you like to hear Bob's three minutes at this time, or? Hello? Yes, I think that's acceptable unless uh, staff has any um, objections. I believe that uh, each individual gets three minutes, so I think he's uh, welcome to, to speak at this time also. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I, Robert Blodgett, am here to elaborate on our proposal for the Escalona Overlook. The Escalona Overlook proposal will create a dedicated public location for enjoying long views out to Monterey Bay. The Overlook will be at the very end of Escalona Drive on Depot Hill and will afford the coastal views from Sea Cliff all the way to Monterey County. The existing Escalona Drive public right-of-way extends toward the coast on its easterly end but stops before reaching the coastal bluff. I currently own a parcel of land between the end of Escalona Drive and the coastal bluff. While most of this parcel includes inaccessible cliff areas, there's an opportunity to create a public viewpoint safely set back from the cliff. Ron and I want to explore dedicating a portion of this lot for a public coastal access area and viewpoint. We will develop the viewpoint area, install benches, and manage the upkeep of the overlook similar to the illustration. This remarkable location will allow the public to enjoy the dramatic views it provides. This location for public access will provide the sweeping views sought by the Coastal Commission staff during the ongoing discussions of business serving zoning for the Monarch Cove properties. Appropriate signage at the easterly end of the pathway on Escalona Drive will direct pedestrian um, visitors along the existing path leading to the overlook location. Creating this new public access to coastal views will provide the opportunity to protect coastal access as sought by the Coastal Commission and at the same time provide the residential zoning for our property at the end of El Salta Drive. We can answer questions if you like. Great, thank you so much. Do we have any additional public comment, uh, either uh, via Zoom or via email? Not see any further attendees with their hands raised. Okay. And there are no written comments. Okay, great. So we will close uh, public comment at this time and bring it back to council for discussion and a motion. I see Council Member Bertrand has his hand up. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I do have a question for the Blodgett's, if I may. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so, Bob, you suggested, and I should disclose, I did meet with them earlier, that you would like to move to one of the three houses um, in your retirement stage in life, which I'm in also, so I respect that. <laughs> uh, which one would you um, want to move in? There's the, the main house, which is, you know, the main person in Monaco, and then the other two. Uh, the main house, that's where I lived when I was going to Cabrillo College, and that's where I spent a lot of time. 
the main house. Uh, the other houses I would have uh, our children live in. Okay. Uh, what do you think of the idea of having some portion, maybe at least one room, given to an Airbnb offering to the public? Uh, that would be all right. Uh, not a room, but a, 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 maybe a structure, separate, a separate structure. A separate structure. Uh, another cottage, you know, a little cottage. That would be better. But you do have some cars. I think on property one and property two, you have cottages. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. yes. The property, yes. The property, uh, property one, there's a small cottage, and that could remain uh, for Airbnb, and then uh, another house could be built on that parcel. And okay. then uh, the center one, uh, which is actually at the end uh, of uh, El Salto Drive, that's kind of a, a, a problem for building another little structure there because it is in the road. But there's obviously lots of room for a little structure uh, on the, the the opposite side, yeah, and especially uh, where the, the the big Victorian is. There's, we could easily put another little house over there for Airbnb. It would be it wouldn't cause any problems whatsoever. So we just Mayor, don't want to run the business anymore. Right. Got it. Um, so Mayor, I just want to follow that. So you know there is an historic nature up there, which I, I'm sure some Templars are well aware of. Mm -hmm. And in consideration of the Coastal Commission's um, need to have coastal access, so I'd like to ask you, Bob, again in real life, would having a, uh, a structure or two to continue that and also the outlook uh, meet with your plans in retirement? Uh, I would, I would think so. Yeah, um, we would, we would, we could do that. We would prefer just the outlook. Just the outlook. But yeah. yes, we would do it. We basically uh, want to live on the property as our houses, uh, legally as as our residences, uh, with our family, with our family, and having those extra little rooms. Uh, it's income, but it's not running in. We don't have employees. We don't have the same pressure. Yeah. We, you know, I'm the one that started the Monarch Club in, and I love the concept, but. Uh, you know, I found out that I'm not going to live forever, so we just can't do this. And there was a lot of time, a lot of times when we the, the business was losing money, and we supported oh, the, the property with other income from other businesses for years. Uh, we're now breaking even now, but that's not you know that's not, that's not good enough. So Thank anyway, we, we we really uh, it's, it's our health uh, that's really the problem. You know, it's just it's just not going to work out. We Ron has got ten stints in her heart in summary. So I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the way it is. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Councilmember Bertron, for your uh, comments. I, I'd like to share, I have some concerns with requiring or mandating um, that they move forward with Airbnb if that's not something that they're um, comfortable with or something that they want to do. Um, it, it seems slightly concerning that we have lots of Airbnbs in town, but we would never require any of those individuals to maintain uh, an Airbnb if they didn't want to or to run a business when they were ready to retire. So I just want to share that I do have um, some concerns with a mandate for them to, to uh, maintain one of their structures for an Airbnb. I'm, I don't have a problem with the council highly encouraging it, um, but as for it to be part of a motion and a vote to mandate that, that um, these individuals maintain an Airbnb, I, I do have concerns with that. So I do want to share that with the council um, and continue the discussion if any council members have any additional comments. Mayor Peterson. Oh. And I'm not seeing any council members with additional comments. Oh, just kidding. Uh, Vice Mayor Brooks, and then after that we'll go to Council Member Bosworth. Sorry. Katie, can you go back to the language again? I just want to have it up on the screen. Because I um, I have the same feelings. I I not that it's a terrible idea to suggest that they they continue having an Airbnb, but I just want the language to be flexible um, for so many different reasons. Um, and I just want to circle back just to see in conjunction with the visitor accommodations or grants of public access. So. Um, Councilmember Bertrand, were you saying to add language in there? Um, what was your suggestion there? I just need some clarification. Well, I would like to add something in there so that um, there could be an option for them to develop an Airbnb or an ADU of some sort so the visitor serving could be still accommodated. Um, I wouldn't force them to do it. It's just an option they could take 
advantage of. And like on option, uh, excuse me, on parcel number one, uh, that's going to be one of the children's um, possessions, I believe, uh, at some point. And so they could take up that option. So I wouldn't want to force anyone to do anything, but in the spirit of visitor accommodating, I'm trying to do something so the Coastal Commission will go along with this. Um, it's been a hotel, I mean, a visitor serving facility for a long time. There's a lot of history. It goes way back before the Balachets. There's cabins up there. Very famous people have been there <laughs> as guests for a long time. So I, I could see that because of the history, the Coastal Commission wants to keep this visitor serving on some level. Uh, the viewpoint is very beautiful, um, but it doesn't give the visitor serving in the same way it did in the past. I've gone out there many times and sat and looked at the ocean with my wife. I totally like the place. And the improvements that the blotches would like to do, I think, would greatly add to it. I've talked to neighbors about it. They'd kind of like it to be a hidden gem. <laughs> Sands and stuff like that may not be to their liking, but if it's public use, then we have to do something like that. So to summarize, I'd like to have um, the option for them to do that. And Airbnb only is in one area of the city. So we'd have to do something to set this aside. If the owners of the property as it moves forward want to do that, then they would have that option. So I don't want to force them to do it, but I want to let the Coastal Commission know that we will provide some a, a, a way to move forward to uh, keep the visitor serving going. So that's my point. I see. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Katie, is that what the language implies? Um, in the Planning Commission's notes there, it says allowed in conjunction with visitor accommodations. Would that cover what Councilmember Bertrand is suggesting? So I, I think it would include that. You could get a little more specific um, and add another sentence following that, that in conjunction with visitor accommodation uses, um, you could specify visitor accommodations may be created um, within accessory dwelling units um, within the same parcel as the single family use. If you wanted to get a little more specific and allow for a secondary dwelling unit, is that or? Um, well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if we left it general, they, they could, they would have to mm -hmm. think, do something in that, in regards to what Councilmember Patron was suggesting, is that correct? They could, they could propose um, okay. Visitors, yeah, and it's more open to anything they would okay. propose. Um, Mayor Peterson, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. Uh, to uh, to accept the Planning Commission's uh, suggestion with uh, an amendment that the note style of single family dwelling allowed in conjunction with visitor accommodation use and grants not for and grant um, public access to to a viewpoint. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We'll continue discussion. Uh, Council Member Botworth had his hand up. Um, before I go to you, Council Member Botworth, I just want a quick clarification. Uh, it sounds like when we're referring to visitor accommodations, we assume that specifically means hotel or Airbnb, but wouldn't the overlook uh, viewpoint itself be a visitor accommodation, just to clarify? No, um, it would be a viewpoint, but an accommodation would be an overnight stay. Okay, specifically. Okay, thank you. Council Member Bodger. Uh, thank you. I'm going to, uh, um, let's see, no, my, my computer was staying unstable, so I've been turning my picture off, but I'm going to leave it on until I start to freeze. We'll see what happens. Okay, so I'm trying to follow um, um, Vice Mayor Brooks's motion, and I guess, Katie, I just want you to explain to me what's the difference between and or or. Is, uh, she changed it to or grant, and I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah, so... Um, Thank you for the question. I would I would want that both of those things exist on the property, yeah. so that an ADU would be part of the property, and that that viewpoint access still um, with the photo that was presented still be created. 
Um, I'm still a little iffy on, on Katie if we need to agendize for another, for a later date on whether we need to come back regarding obtaining that, that parcel or whatever you called it in order to follow through on, on that viewpoint. So that's why I said and. Okay. So that would, for the purposes of a future single family dwelling, that would come forward at the time of review of the application. The, the only what reason we would bring it forward separately is if the city council asked for it separate, just because we wanted to acquire the land, but not okay, tied to so the application. Answer, yes, in order to acquire the land, we need to request it as an agendized item, correct? Correct, and it would be separate from any development application. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and so with my mo did I answer your question, Council Member Bosworth? Uh, possibly. I'm, I'm going to ask Katie to clarify it, okay, because the, the way that I'm reading this is the, the, uh, the owners have the option of, of providing visitor accommodations or granting the viewpoint. And it appeared to me that they are more leaning towards granting the viewpoint, not necessarily providing visitor accommodation. And I don't want to mandate that they have to do both. And that's why I was asking Katie to clarify, are we mandating that they must do both? Because what, what I would rather give them the option to do it if they desire, but if they put and in there, then I'm meaning that they have to do both. And I just wanted you to clarify that, Katie. That's correct. The Planning Commission put in OR as an option to providing on-site visitor accommodations. By changing the OR to an AND, they would have to do both. Right. And, and from what I heard the Blodgett say uh, is that, you know, that they want to live there. They don't necessarily want to provide accommodations. I'm sure that if they decided to VRBO or any other type of option, they could do that at their own will. They don't need us to authorize that. Uh, but by putting the end in there, here I am again dictating what they have to do. And I'm reading that the reason that they're granting this viewpoint was because that was the way for them to get their property back, retire in peace, and allow the coastal access by the word or. And I believe the planning commission was going down that path. So I don't want to undo what was, what was been done. I, I'm not comfortable. I'm personally not comfortable with mandating that. I think that the, the, the ability to have any type of uh, overnight stay on that property should be up to their discretion. So I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be comfortable with the word and in there. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bosworth. Um, I see uh, Ben Noble has his hand up, so we'll go to you next, and we'll come back to you, Councilmember Bertrand. Okay. Thank you. So um, de depending on how the council goes um, on this, if, if you do decide to keep open the option for a vacation rental um, but not to mandate it, uh, what I would suggest is we make sure that it's very clear that vacation rentals is an allowed use. Right now, under lodging, it lists hostels, inns, bed and breakfast, and, and hotels as a conditionally allowed use. Um, I would want to make sure that there's no confusion that um, vacation rentals is also um, an allowed use on the property. And then the other thing I was going to say is that if the council decides to um, require vacation rentals uh, on the property, it might be um, useful to specify if each individual parcel requires a, a vacation rental unit or if there just needs to be one or two in total on all three properties. Okay, let's go to Councilmember Bertrand. I believe you are next with your hand up, and then we'll go to Councilmember Bosworth. Um, thank you. Um, uh, ben, I appreciate your clarification. Um, so my, my main thrust here is to make sure that the Coastal Commission 
accepts what the city council of Capitol would like. And I believe their main issue is coastal access in terms of staying overnight and not just to walk up to a view. And so I'd like some clarification on that because if all they care about is a view and that's good enough, then fine. Um, so a nominal one bedroom to one of the houses or two of the houses, and I agree with you, Ben, we have to specify not a hotel or anything like that, but something that's visitor serving that the lodges could um, take advantage of in the future or some future owner could take advantage of. And so I only bring that up because I want to get this thing to the Coastal Commission. Um, and this is why I asked the Blodges if this is something they were comfortable with, and there seemed to be agreement to do that. So um, I don't think they feel it's been forced. They're being offered an option. So I'd like some clar uh, clarification to you from you. Yes. So in terms of getting this through a uh, Coastal Commission, what is their main objective? Do they care that much about a viewpoint, or are they really still wanting to keep the traditional use of a uh, visitor serving a facility that actually has rooms and so, all those options that go with it. So in, in bringing, you know, we submitted the update that you can see the second um, box on the slide. The Coastal Commission would, they were willing to allow a single family dwelling only if ancillary to visitor accommodating uses. So in in reading that, um, it would have to be secondary to visitor accommodating uses. So right now, the, they've got 15 bedrooms on the site. I read that to say that they'd like at least half of those to be utilized as uh, visitor accommodations. Um, it's not, they, they're very clear that they still wanted visitor accommodations on the site. If the city council this evening wanted to um, utilize the planning commission language, but then add something more specific of what those visitor accommodation uses are. Um, it would be, I think it would help in the long run for when this does get, when an application would go before the planning commission to specify, as Ben suggested, that it would be allowed for nightly rental. It would also be helpful um, to specify if, you know, we heard from the Owners tonight say that although not ideal, they could live with a secondary unit on site that was a nightly rental. Um, to write that in the code is a little is more helpful if that got adopted by the city by the mm -hmm. coastal commission because then we have it in our code and it's very clear that the intent was to allow secondary dwellings that could be rented nightly. How it is now, um, it's kind of open with allowed in conjunction with visitor accommodation use or a grant of public access to a viewpoint. There's a lot of interpretation for the in conjunction with visitor accommodation. So if you do want to make it a little less strict than what the Coastal Commission staff was recommending, then I would suggest putting stronger language in there that would support that vision. If, if And just remember the Coastal Commission staff their red lines are really what they wanted to see us adopt. So I think it's very clear what their intent was for visitor accommodations to remain on the site. If we want to better define that, it may be helpful for future applications. Are they willing to compromise? I mean, the blotches would, in a sense, like to get out of the hotel business, but moving part way in the direction of uh, the Coastal Commission, do you think that would be something they might agree to? I mean, you can't read their minds, but, you know, we're, we're trying to provide something if, you know, if the motion gets changed to recognize them. Yeah, I, I think if we have better chances of getting it passed if there's some type of visitor accommodation uses on the site. Okay. And by visitor accommodation, you, you mean overnight lodging, right? And we would Correct. need to better define that as overnight lodging. So I didn't make the motion, but um, um, is that... Maybe uh, Ben could offer some wording, or Katie could offer some wording now that might get us a little bit closer to a position that Capitola could take that would meet the city, um, excuse me, the Coastal Commission's needs and desires. Thank you, um, Councilmember Bertrand. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind, I would be okay with defining the visitor accommodations to reflect overnight lodging, vacation rentals and 
if we should go so far as to say um, at least one. Um, to Katie's point, with the uh, Coastal Commission note that they were suggesting that about half maintain um, be maintained on the property as overnight accommodation. And so kind of by saying at least one overnight accommodation and the viewpoint access, I think, would get us closer to what the Coastal Commission um, suggestions or recommendations were um, and not put so much pressure on the current um, owners of the property. Also, I'm comfortable with my, 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 um, my motion because we don't, we want to, I feel that I should create, we should create language not just for those who own it now, but for their children and whoever owns it in the future. And so by opening these two things, uh, um, would allow them. We wouldn't be saying that they couldn't do anything any longer should someone want to come back and reopen the historical property aspect of it. So I'm comfortable with the motion with adding some language um, from Mr. Noble and Katie um, if if that's okay with you guys. It's okay with me. Um, the idea is to craft something that's workable with us, the City Council, and Coastal Commission. Okay, I believe we still have a motion and a second. Councilmember Botworth, do you have your hand up? I do, thank you, Mayor. Katie, um, in, in this entire large document that we're trying to approve, is this the only red line that we are, have not accepted? Have we, are there any other red lines that exist in any other uh, ordinances? There, there are quite a few that we've come to compromise on. We'll see in the final document because we did make uh, quite a few changes over the last round. So um, I, I think we're we're on the same page for the majority of the document. Mm -hmm. um, we, but this is one of the, the ones that I wouldn't be surprised that if, if we modified it uh, to not require visitor accommodations that we might get a red line back on this. But then the, if that were to happen, you know, it would come back to the city council and you could make the decision whether or not to accept the red line and have the code adopted or uh, work on another round of revisions. But, but there's still multiple changes that we've made. Yeah, for what it's worth, um, I, I don't feel that we're uh, doing the, uh, the owners any favors by forcing them to have visitor accommodations. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Bosworth. Uh, do we have any additional comments from or questions from Councilmember? Seeing none, I believe we have uh, a motion. Oh, just kidding. My apologies, Councilmember Bertrand. Yeah. Um, so I think we're on a timeline here to some extent. So I'd, I'd like to get a better idea of uh, Katie. Um, if we had to go back and forth on the Mono Cove, um, I'm wondering how much time that could take. And then there's another question, more to the point. Maybe we could get some time to figure this out. Can can we have a carve out for Mono Cove while that gets hashed out, and the rest of the city code, if it's adopted by the uh, Coastal Commission, go into effect? Is that a possibility? At this point, I, I wouldn't suggest that. We have uh, that chapter is part of a bigger picture for visitors serving. We created a new visitors serving overlay. It would just, it would impact the rest of the code dramatically not to include that chapter at this point. My best okay. advice would be to move forward with something that the city council is feels um, comfortable with and um, at, at this point and then we may possibly get a red line from the Coastal Commission. At that time, you'll make a decision of whether or not to accept it or to go back through the process, which would require going to, you know, public hearing at Planning Commission with a recommendation and City Council. So. Well, Madam Mayor, if I can make one more comment. Um, I remember when this first came before the City Council, I can tell you were pretty clear that the Coastal Commission wanted to retain this as, coastal, as visitor serving in the terms of a, of a 
hotel, motel moniker that it's called right now. So I think they've been pretty adamant since the beginning, and since the beginning of this discussion, you've been relaying that position to us very clearly. So I think that we need to offer something that allows for a compromise to the uh, Coastal Commission, something that clearly from the comments from the Blotschitz, uh, Bob in particular, they're willing to uh, take a little bit, um, but not everything. And the little bit is to provide some accommodations to people who would like to rent a home uh, or an ADU or, um, you know, something of that sort, but not not what they've been doing, which they'd like to rec- uh, retire from. So when it comes to vote, I think we should think in terms of we would like this Coastal Commission to be in a position to agree with us, and we'd like to be in a position so that the code can move forward. There's a lot of issues that aren't being covered the way the city council would like to have it covered because the Coastal Commission has not approved of what we've uh, approved some time ago. We've had these hang-ups, and we need to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bertrand. I see uh, Ben Noble has his hand up. It's just a couple of things for the council to consider. Um, I would be very surprised if the Coastal Commission doesn't uh, require additional revisions to the zoning code overall um, in addition to this issue. Um, so I, I, think, I think based on my experience, you can, you can expect a conditional cer- certification that will require you to make um, additional changes to the zoning code. And this may may just be one of many. Um, the other thing to consider is that there's a difference between Coastal Commission staff and the Coastal Commission itself. Um, sometimes the the commission takes a different um, perspective or position from staff. Um, so it it might it might be um, preferable to move forward with the city's preference on this particular issue even if staff has a different perspective, and wait to see what the Coastal Commission does um, when it comes before them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mayor Brooks, looks like you have your hand up. Yeah, I just have one question about Airbnbs for Katie. Um, when we say overnight accommodations, is that even or is it even required that there's language in our zoning code that around that? Like, do we even need to have that language? So, should they in the future want to have an Airbnb on one of their properties? Do we need that sort of language in the zoning code? We do for this property. So, our vacation rental zone is specifically in our um, in our village. And so if we wanted to allow vacation rentals, which is defined as 30 days or less on this site, we would want to specifically call that out. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead, um, if Mayor Peterson may, can I call the question? Sure. We can go, thank you. Let's uh, let's go ahead and we have a motion in a second and Vice Mayor Brooks has called the question, so let's have a roll call vote, please. Um, could could we get clarification on the if the original motion was amended to include a vacation rental in there as well as uh, there was mention of possibly requiring just one of the three units to be utilized as vacation rental? Is that a question for me or for Chloe? Um, for you. Okay. Um, so, single-family dwelling allowed in conjunction with overnight lodging and visitor accommodation. Um, I should say with at least one overnight lodging and visitor accommodation. Then I'm going to help use your help if you want to jump in. Um, is that cover what we were discussing? Yeah, I think. Um, with at least one of the three structures. Correct. Um, it, and I think are, instead, are of, we sure? instead of overnight lodging, should it be vacation rental then? So my, my understanding of the discussion is to um, require um, 
one overnight lodging unit on the property, not necessarily that in an existing structure needs to be converted into overnight lodging, but that if the if the property owner wanted to construct a, another accessory um, building, for example, and then rent that out as overnight accommodation, uh, that would be okay. But we would we would not be requiring one of the three um, buildings to be utilized as overnight accommodation. Okay. And the overlook. Right, Katie, did you get that piece of it? I did. So yep. oh, okay. So allowed in conjunction with at least one overnight accommodation on the property and grant uh, public access to a viewpoint on the property. Okay, so uh, staff has the motion. We have a motion and a second. It's been called to question. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botworth. No. Councilmember Store, uh, excuse me, Councilmember Story is recused. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. No. So motion dies, uh, or, or motion fails to pass, I suppose would be the uh, appropriate language. Uh, so it returns to council. Uh, council Member Botworth, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think, uh, I appreciate the motion and the intent. I think what's, uh, what's important here is, is, as Ben pointed out, this is not the only item that we object to. I don't particularly like that the Coastal Commission demands stuff from us and What's being happened here is this is, as Ben mentioned, Coastal Commission staff, not necessarily the commission who ultimately makes the final decision. Um, I don't feel comfortable with the language. I feel comfortable with what the Planning Commission spent a lot of time coming up with. It may not be what the Coastal Commission staff wanted, but as Ben mentioned, this is not the only item that we have red lines up. So I would like to make a motion that we approve what is printed, uh, the recommended action as printed uh, and, and pass this and return this back to the Coastal Commission. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it for discussion. Okay, we have a second for the sake of discussion. Um, I have a question. Uh, Katie and, and Ed, afterwards, please let me know if you feel comfortable with this. Katie, would it make sense to keep the Planning Commission language and then add a sentence that says, um, that essentially that visitor accommodations are allowed on this property at any time, but not required. So would it make sense to say that single family dwelling allowed only uh, in conjunction with visitor accommodations use or grant of public access to a viewpoint, but visitor, visitor accommodation use is always allowed on this property, should they decide to, to ever utilize that option? So I believe in the land use table that visitor accommodations are allowed. Um, so that, that's uh, already set up within the visitor serving overlay. There's, it, is, does that make, is that clear? So with No, because I, uh, we, were, we were talking earlier about would the property owners have the right to do something like an Airbnb? And we were, uh, if, I, if I heard correctly, the answer was no, because the, um, that, that is specifically to the village. So I'm just trying to find a way that we can put it in the wording that they need to, you know, the, the public access to the viewpoint is essentially required um, and that they can have their single family dwelling as long as they provide that access to a viewpoint. But if at any point they decide they want to do an Airbnb or a visitor accommodation of some other sort, that that is their right to do so so that they don't have to come back and have a whole other conversation with us about the TOT overlay, essentially. Okay, so to clarify, visitor accommodations has a separate um, definition than nightly rental. So one thing you, the city council from the conversation, from what I'm hearing, we may wanna change the, from the planning commission recommendation, the term visitor accommodations. Oh, okay, um, so within the planning 
commission recommendation, they utilize the term visitor accommodations. And I'm going to look to Ben, but I believe Ben was clarifying earlier that visitor accommodations is defined as a hotel uh, um, use and there's a separate term within, and there were a couple other things that fit under there, maybe motel, um, but a separate term that's used in the zoning code, which we keep referring to is our um, vacation rental. So if we want this to be utilized as an Airbnb vacation rental, um, I would suggest changing the termino terminology for visitor accommodations to vacation rental. And then, um, Mayor Peterson, your comment, if, if we had a sentence after that that said vacation rental, maybe, you know, it would actually, by saying allowed in conjunction with vacation rental, um, we could add vacation rental to the land use table as an allowed use. That would be the appropriate place to put that. Um, and Ben, I'm going to look to you for if you're in agreement that changing the term visitor accommodations is in, is aligned with this conversation. Yeah. So, so what I would su suggest is changing visitor accommodations to overnight lodging, which is more clear, and then adding to the land use table specifically that vacation rentals is an allowed use um, would clear up any ambiguity on that, which I think is c consistent with what what, what this motion is contemplating. So that would allow them the opportunity, but not require that they do it, correct? Right, correct. Um, Council Member Botswer, would you be willing to accept a friendly amendment to your motion for that wording or no? Um, yes, as long as the word or remains in there, because that gives them the option, okay? And, it, it, and, and I'm fine with the substitution of the term. That totally leaves it up to the property owner to decide how they want to provide uh, overnight accommodation. At least that's what I heard them say. I, I was fine with that explanation. Great. And Council Member Bertrand, uh, do you accept that amendment as well as the seconder? Um, yeah, I, I do have a question, though, and um, I'd like to get both to some degree. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, because I want to get an agreement from the Postal Commission, um, does this wording, as if it's accepted, um, allow for some future owner of the main Monaco building to turn that back into a, um, an Airbnb of some sort? Yes. Okay. The hotel well, remains a, a, an allowed use. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. With that, I accept the uh, amendments, the amended wording. Okay. Council Member Balter, Council Member Bertrand, you both have your hands up still. I just want to make sure you don't have any further comments. Mine's down. Okay. All right. Seeing then, um, the staff, do you understand the, the motion in the second? Is it then? Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. We have a motion in the second. So let's uh, have a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Bertrand. Aye. Councilmember Botworth. Aye. Councilmember Story is recused. Vice Mayor Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Great. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, invite Council Member Story to return. Back there. And we will move on uh, to topic number two of the evening, I believe, is village parking. Everyone's favorite <laughs> top. Okay. And I will hand it over to Steph. Great. Okay, and we have Council Member Story is back. Great. Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor. Bef tonight we're going to discuss village parking. Um, our, our village, as you all know, is extremely unique, and one of the characteristics that, that here's a different place that looks very lively and unique as well. Um, one of the characteristics that makes it unique is all these storefronts that are right up to the sidewalk and minimal curb cuts. Once you start introducing curb cuts, it really changes the experience of the pedestrian walking through your village. 
So typically, um, the villages that we've come to love have this setting of storefronts right along the frontage, and the pedestrian feels safe as they walk along the sidewalk, and they're not looking for cars entering. They can just look at the next shop as they're walking along a restaurant. Um, and here we've got a nice picture of our, our vast sidewalks connected with minimal curb cuts. Um, back when the zoning code was updated for this section that we're going to talk about, it was actually in our land use plan that's um, for the coastal area that set the tone for this code amendment, stating that uh, minimal curb cuts and talked about having parking that could be required for development, but it had to be located outside of the village, and then there were a few exceptions. When we took this to Planning Commission, so here's the, the existing current standards. These were adopted, I think, back in 1989, and it says that parking must be provided on sites outside of the village area, but within walking distance or a remote shuttle. Um, the exceptions to that was for non-historic structures in residential overlays. So with a non-historic structure, when you're building a new structure, there's usually an opportunity to put some parking right on site. Then also um, the Capitola Theater site and the Mercantile site, and it was clear that uh, driveway cuts should be minimized, the ground floor frontage should be commercial development, and that parking areas or structures should be located on the interior of the site and that uh, they, you can also make an exception to on-site parking due to FEMA regulations for flood. Um, when we brought our updated code, we had removed the exception for historic structures um, and the specificity um, on, well, just the historic structures. When we brought it to Coastal Commission staff, they added back in the non-historic structures within the residential overlays to allow the exceptions to off-site parking. And then they created greater specificity for the Capitola Theater site um, to the point that they, in the red lines you see, it may, may accommodate limited on-site parking to serve ADA, so for uh, our disabilities, guests and valet or similar shuttle system. However, off-site parking is strongly encouraged to the maximum extent possible. For any parking located on site, driveway cuts shall be minimized and parking areas will not be located along the street frontage. I want to call attention to that Capitola Theater site and the additional um, language put in by the Coastal Commission about strongly encouraged uh, for off site parking to the extent feasible. Within our um, review of a future hotel on that site, we would be looking at a parking study, and one of the findings required is to um, make sure that whatever development is proposed, that it has minimal impacts to traffic, and uh, that would be looked at through the process um, of looking at a study, seeing what's proposed, and making sure that the finding is met, that whatever is being proposed for the theater site, uh, that it has a minimal impact to, to traffic on the village. So when, when we saw the, um, the Coastal Commission edits, really one of our main goals in updating our zoning code was to make the language clear and easy to understand. We felt that this revision didn't quite hit it, and the Planning Commission, when we brought it to them, they said, you know, it's still unclear. Please take this to the City Council for further discussion and clean it up further. Um, so I don't have a, sp I have a new recommendation from staff on this one that the Planning Commission has not reviewed, um, but their suggestion was simply, staff, please make this more easy to understand that this is more about curb cuts and not everything in between. So we've cleaned it up um, and gotten a little more specific. We did not add the, the Coastal Commission um, recommended changes of strongly encouraged to the maximum extent feasible. We feel that will be within the findings of any application that will be reviewed. Um, but we outlined exactly what, what the regulations are, and instead of saying having an exception just for historic sites, we included the actual residential overlays and where you can have on-site parking because it's not 
um, within our commercial core. And any project that is um, tied to residential, if it's a historic property, will be reviewed by our architectural historian to make sure that it, it complies um, and, and the parking is adequately placed. So we've also added a map within the zoning code to show exactly where uh, the curb cuts would be prohibited along the commercial core and where they would be allowed along the Cherry Ave residential area, Riverview, and Cliff Drive. Um, so this is the new language and And staff is recommending that council provide direction on the requirements for the parking, for parking in the village. I do want to add that the reference to offsite parking is for our in lieu program, and that is a policy which is separate from the zoning code. And we do not want our. I would recommend that we do not incorporate our in lieu policy into the zoning code because then it's subject to LCP updates and Coastal Commission review every time we change, make modifications to it. So tonight we're not asking for an in-depth conversation on our in-lieu program. We're always happy to bring that back. Right now, our in-lieu program can be utilized for a future village hotel or a smaller hotel. Um, and with that, we will. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'll bring it to council for questions. I see that council member Bertrand has his hand up. Yeah, um, he, I was trying to find out um, a little bit more from your perspective, what was the problem with encouraging a shuttle system in a town where traffic has always been a problem, and also considering that the input of the people that came to the many meetings we had on the general plan one of the issues that brought up a lot of resistance was a uh, large parking accommodation on a future hotel on the um, theater side. And the other thing is the MD program is something, from my understanding, that can be taken advantage of. Uh, it's not necessarily, necessarily required the um, hotel owner would, would do uh, as a way to provide parking. So those are my two questions. Okay, um, the option to, um, under on the slide under um, 1B, the Planning Commission may still allow off-site parking, um, either within walking distance of the use which it serves or located on a remote site served by a shuttle. So that, that is still um, an allowance within this review. Okay. So that... But we're not... We haven't removed that, so it either has to be within walking distance or within a shuttle system, and it is a great alternative. Um, but, but we're taking away, as, I'm sorry, I don't want to stop your comments. And, okay, so more specifically, you're asking um, why we didn't accept the Coastal Commission um, edit saying off-site parking is strongly encouraged to the maximum extent feasible. You're welcome to put Correct. that back in. Um, as staff, we have a special section of the code that's for um, development either at the theater site or at the, the area around the mall for increase mm -hmm. the incentivized areas. And within the Capitola theater site, there are specific findings. I think there's five findings, one of which is that the proposed development will not have um, will protect existing public parking as well as uh, not have a, you know, there has to be findings that it's um, not impacting the village um, traffic. You know, it's supposed to mitigate the traffic. So it's, I felt like within the existing findings for that incentivized development, we have to really look closely at what they're proposing in terms of the parking and circulation mix to make findings to support the future project so that it's not, um, so that it's mitigated. So whether or not we want to, it felt, it, it felt um, too much to add it, add almost this finding and suggestion 
within this criteria rather than that that of course is something that when an application comes in we'll be looking at and what the impacts are for whatever they're proposing in terms of parking Does that answer your question, Councilor Overturn? I, I miss the strong suggestion that we want to emphasize a shuttle system. Um, I'm already hearing broadcasting from the Swensons that, you know, based on their experience with the public parking now, that any kind of parking on the site for the hotel would be fine. Um, they're already taking that position based on data collected from totally different uh, land use, and they're going to keep pushing this issue, and I believe unless Capitola takes a strong stance in our hope and suggestion that we have a shuttle system in place um, early on, we're not going to get something that meets the needs of Capitola residents. And the main impact here is people who come to Capitola, and it's crowded, really crowded, and... Um, have cars showing back and forth um, is going to impact that, and the experience of people visiting capital is going to be minimized. So I want to suggest that we do um, suggest strongly that a shuttle system be part of the consideration. Okay, thank That's you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor Overtron. Uh, just a quick reminder that this is just the time for questions from Council. We still need to go to public comment on this item. So if anyone has any additional questions, now would be the time. Okay, hearing none. Or say, oh, Vice Mayor Brooks, do you have a question? Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get that button clicked. Um, on the language, um, I just want a clear definition, Katie, on intensified uses. Your MUV zoning district, um, I believe it's on the other slide. Yeah, new development and intensified uses. I was just curious on what you your your intention of that was. That is whenever you um, a new land use. Um, so if you have a retail shop that transfers to um, to a restaurant, the intensified use is defined in the code as the increase in parking requirements. So at that point, if the parking requirement is increased it's considered an intensified use and therefore there would have to be uh, the parking requirement would need to be met and that's something that uh, the Coastal Commission defines that's how they define intensified uses by parking great thanks Katie and Katie can you talk a little bit into the mic I'm having trouble hearing you oh I'm sorry <laughs> um, so did you hear that the intensified use is based on parking calculations so if a developer were to go from retail to a restaurant there would be an intensified use because retail is at one parking space per 240 mm -hmm. and I'm just estimating and uh, a restaurant is one pace one space per 60 um, square feet of Restaurant, so therefore there would be an intensification of use, and it's based on the parking requirement for that land use. Thank you. All right, if there's no additional questions, we will bring this item to public comment, and I will turn it over to our moderator to let us know if there are any public comments, uh, either through Zoom or via email. Thank you. Uh, I do see one hand raised, so uh, I will take that Jesse Bristow. Yeah. Hello, good evening. Uh, Jesse Bristow with Swanson Builders. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I uh, just wanted to uh, comment on um, item number two or number two of the location of parking. Um, with the outlook for potential hotel, right now there's currently two curb cuts, uh, an, an entrance and an exit. And I think if we, um, under our current plan or redesign plan, the main access would be off El Camino Medio. And as part of that and with the general plan, 
and even in this in this red line, it suggests a valet or a shuttle system. So, um, which we're all about supporting. Uh, we just want to emphasize that we do have a kind of drop off concept on Monterey uh, for a potential valet or a shuttle system. We just want to make sure that this red line wouldn't uh, impose any uh, restrictions on, on um, a future hotel, especially since we'd be eliminating a curb cut and having an exit and entrance on uh, Camino Medio. So that's the only comment I have uh, at this point for for this red line. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any additional uh, public comment via email? There have been no public comments via email. Okay, great. So at this point, we'll close uh, public comment, bring it back to the council. Katie, can you speak um, briefly to the question that was just asked? Would uh, the redlining as, as the Coastal Commission redlines prohibit a drop-off or pickup valet service or shuttle service? Uh, I think the Coastal Commission red lines would support that for a, coast, for a drop off or pick up. And the, the revised, I'm going to go back to that slide for you. Um, under B, for the Capitola Theater site and Mercantile site, if driveway cuts are minimized to the extent possible, so it gives some flexibility there, and parking areas are generally located on the interior of the site. So. Planning Commission, uh, in reviewing the hotel site, wanted to maintain a lot of flexibility in the standards. That was clear from our discussion on hotel height, which is next, but um, just keeping it flexible for a future developer to bring in the best design. Great, thank but, you. But I don't think it's it can... Sorry, go ahead, Katie. It, it doesn't stand in the way of, um, it, it keeps it flexible for drop-offs and valet. Uh, did I say I just, did you have your hand up? No? Okay, my apologies. Uh, are there any additional comments uh, or questions from Council? Council Member Botworth, I see your hand up. Thank you, uh, thank you Mayor. Uh, um, I, I like this section. I think it's written very well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to approve staff, staff recommendation with one small modification. In item B uh, of the screen that's being displayed, where it says the planning commission may permit off-site parking for non-residential uses, I would like that to be rewritten to residential and non-residential. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? There, um, I'll second the motion uh, with the amended language. Okay, we have a motion and a second uh, with amend uh, amendments to the language on the screen here. Uh, Council Member Story, did you have any additional comments? Well, I, I would like to follow up maybe um, just to uh, convey to the uh, for Council and the audience my reason for supporting the motion. Um, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if it uses the best language. Um, some of the wording is uh, rather generalized and, uh, and vague, uh, such as to the extent possible and, um, and on the interior of the site. Um, however, I view this provision as really placing the discretion and authority on the part of the Planning Commission. Um, and it gives them a wide, um, I think, flexible path to work with any developer to come up with whatever the appropriate solutions may be for Capitola in the future. Um, and, you know, maybe that is a combination of on-site parking, maybe that's uh, valet parking, maybe that's off-site parking, and um, I'm confident that the Planning Commission um, can work out the right issues for Capitola at the time, taking all the factors into consideration um, and, and, you know, and working with the developer to forge, um, I think, a project that's going to be um, 
um, I think, overall beneficial to the city. So those are the reasons why I second the motion and will uh, support it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Story. Council Member Bertrand, do you have your hand up also? No, I, I believe that the um, staff that came up with this recommendation did craft um, something that is um, very easy to understand and maybe not as vague as the other, but I don't think it reflects strongly what um, city residents have expressed many times in the past about how we need to control traffic in Capitol Village and with the possibility of a hotel at this point is 76 or so uh, rooms and the cars and traffic that come with that, including onboarding and such for um, just the maintenance of the place, it is a bit much. And this this um, does not really address what the city of Capitol residents have said. Uh, starting with the city planning, excuse me, with the general plan process and moving forward. So I'm not going to vote for it. Thank you, Councilmember Bertrand. Are there any additional comments or questions from Council? Vice Mayor Brooks. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, reading this, I, I agree with Councilmember's story that the the language is very broad, and the, it allows the Planning Commission to go in in any direction um, necessary. I feel that there's. Um, you know, the truth is that there's just, we just have a parking problem and a circulation problem down in the village, and it is a hard issue to resolve. And with the one, this, this possibility of adding more parking, um, just so that we can have a process in place that, that will allow for, for many people to talk about and brainstorm through, this allows for that process to take place. So I'll go ahead and um, I, I'm in, in agreement with the motion on the table. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Uh, let's see, I'll give it a second just to see if there's any additional council comments. Oh, uh, Katie, did you have? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I think um, this would be in line with the, the motion that's on the table, but under B, I think we should strike for non-residential use, and therefore it would include both residential and commercial and be in line with um, council member Bottorf's uh, motion, but rather than say that they're both allowed, we just strike for non-residential use. Councilmember Member Bottorf, uh, how do you feel about that idea for a potential amendment to your motion? I, you know, Katie, you kind of broke up. If you could say oh. that again, I'm gonna okay. look clear. For, for B, I would suggest that we just strike for non-residential use. So it would say the Planning Commission may permit off-site parking if the spaces are within walking distance of the use which it serves and located on a remote site. Therefore, it would include both residential and non-residential. Um, fine. Is that fine? Your wording is probably better. Thank you. Thank you. And Councilor Member Story, you have seconded that motion. Are you uh, in agreement with that amendment? Um, yeah, that's acceptable. Great. Okay. Uh, if there's no additional comments from the council, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Councilmember Bertrand. No. Councilmember Botworth. Aye. Councilmember Story. Aye. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. And Mayor Peterson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carried uh, four to one. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on now to the next uh, topic within this agenda item, which is related to uh, specifically to the uh, uh, potential future village hotel site. Um, I am uh, live within a, a certain boundary that will require me to recuse myself from this item. So I'm going to turn uh, the meeting over to Vice Mayor Brooks and virtually uh, step out until the remaining uh, until this item has, has been concluded. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Peterson. We'll go ahead and go, uh, move into staff's presentation for topic three, Village Hotel and Heights. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, so this last topic is about the future village hotel height. As I mentioned earlier, this uh, property is 
zoned within the updated zoning code to have incentives for additional height and floor area ratio if it meets certain um, um, criteria as public benefits. Um, in reviewing the village hotel height, the Coastal Commission made some, uh, Coastal staff made some recommendations to modify the initial language that was adopted in 2018, and their modifications are shown on the screen. Specifically, they made one change to fix, we had one of the APN numbers not included, so they've added that. Second, they, um, in the, the Planning Commission had, had, had set the maximum height of the hotel that it must remain below the elevation of the bluff behind the hotel, and the coastal staff um, modified that to say, including, so the maximum height of the hotel, and then including all rooftop architectural elements such as chimneys, cupolas, et cetera, and all mechanical apparatuses such as elevator shafts, HVAC units, et cetera, remain, and they also added at least 10 feet below the, the top elevation of the bluff behind the hotel. So they got much more specific in the criteria of how that would be measured. Um, they also added the bluff, the viewpoints that the bluff behind the hotel remain visible from, and they added the Capitola Beach, Cliff Drive, and the Capitola Wharf as a green edge and added above the visible top of hotel with existing mature trees maintained on site. Um, when we took this to Planning Commission, again, they really wanted to allow maximum discretion for the best design in the future. And so they suggested not adding, not accepting the changes for the 10 feet, as well as not accepting the changes for the projections above the rooftop for mechanical equipment. Um, and then further, they suggested revising the viewpoints. So Capitola Beach is much lower than the hotel site. And from that vantage point, it would be very difficult, no matter what size building was built there, to, to maintain that visible line. The Coastal Commission staff, we've talked to them about that, and they agree with removing that suggestion of theirs for the viewpoint from the Capitola Beach. We also thought it would be, um, the Planning Commission suggested for the Cliff Drive viewpoint to get more specific in the description of that. Um, so here you're seeing the Planning Commission recommendation of crossing out Capitola Beach, getting more specific that the southern, the southern parking lot along the bluff or cliff of Cliff Drive, um, and adding and the Capitola Wharf as a green edge above the visible top of the hotel. So, so here I've got some visuals to show you what this means. So. Um, Sorry, there's the Zoom information is in front of the, the language. But to the maximum height, um, the Planning Commission was saying let, to remove the 10-foot requirement. Um, here we have the proposal. This was the con conceptual review that went before Planning Commission and City Council. I wanted to give you an idea of what the 10 feet would look like. Um, and I think this elevation is better. So what you're seeing here is this is the line of the bluff. The top of the bluff is at 63 feet. Um, here is the, ele the height of each story. So as we go up, um, 10 feet below the bluff would be between the fourth and fifth story of the conceptual review that came before City Council. Um, the proposal as it was, the elevator was five feet below the bluff and the fifth story was six and a half feet below the bluff just to give you an idea so if you were to go with the coastal commission recommendation the 10 foot line would be somewhere within the um, fifth story and also none the elevator would not be able to go beyond that so most likely you'd be seeing four stories with an elevator um, or you know that that's what could fit within that area um, also, the Planning Commission recommended modifications to the, um, the viewpoints. So here's the view from the Capitola Wharf taken today. Um, so again, as, as that parcel is built up, there would still need to be a, um, 
a green edge that's visible from the top of the hotel with existing mature trees maintained on site. And here is the view from the southern parking lot of Cliff Drive. So with that, we're looking for city council feedback um, on the planning commission recommend, recommended changes. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Katie. So we'll go ahead and open it up to questions for council members. I see that council member Story's hand was up first, and then council member Bertrand, you'll be next. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Brooks. Um, Katie, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, one uh, from the Coastal Commission, do you have a sense, did they explain why 10 feet? Um, why not five, why not 20? I, I was just wondering how they kind of latched on to that uh, number. And then um, on the Planning Commission's recommendation uh, that the height should um, be um, below the top elevation of the bluff, were they meaning, was, is that implying that any architectural features could extend above the height of the bluff? And those are my two questions. Okay. Um, so why the 10 feet was the first question. And I think um, in talking with the Coastal Commission, they thought it would be better to have something uh, numerical that we could measure from and just easier guidance to follow for as the applicant. And they um, they didn't say exactly why 10 feet, but I think it's because they thought that would achieve the goal of, you know, this language of um, maintaining the, the green edge comes directly from our general plan. And so I think it was the intent of the Coastal Commission just to make it um, something that we can measure and be more quantitative rather than qualitative is, is what I got from their feedback. The second question um, of the Planning Commission, did they consider these architectural elements? And I think is their, I, I believe their intent with this was that the architectural elements and um, HVAC systems would still have to be under that maximum height and be below the elevation of the bluff. Um, it couldn't go beyond that, but not to specifically call it out as 10 feet and include within that 10 feet all of the um, mechanical and architectural elements. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Council Member Story. Um, next, uh, we, I see Council Member Bertrand's hand is raised. And Council Member Story, um, your hand is still raised. If you can please unraise your hand. Thank you. Yeah, I was dealing with the same question that Sam brought up. And, um, you know, this discussion, I think, came forward in the general plan, and I'm glad Katie referenced that. So, Katie, um, would you please comment on the relative height of the other buildings that are on El Domino, uh, El Nino, <laughs> never get that name right, that are up against the bluff? They seem to be definitely way below 10 feet from the bluff top. Um, do you have a sense of what those distances are? Um, I I don't know the distances of that. I haven't measured, but um, they are below the bluff, definitely. Those those homes, you know, the way in which we measure height is from existing grades. So as you, as a, with a steep slope, you can continue to work within your height requirement. The buildings can step up the slope. So that's what you're seeing in El Camino Medio. Um, but to estimate, I I would say, you know, the, the closest one to the hotel seems to be the closest to the bluff. That, that gap there might be 10 feet or probably more because it's all relative to where you're standing and uh, looking at the image. So I, I hate to give you an inaccurate number. I'm just not sure. But 
No, that, that's all right. I, I'm, I'm just trying to get to where the Coastal Commission is thinking, and I, I sort of agree with Sam. What was the, excuse me, the same concern Sam had? And I, I think the whole idea of a green strip that you would see is where they're trying to, you know, go to. You know, they want to preserve that that sense of uniformity. And I was just wondering, is that the way the Coastal Commission approaches this? as opposed to allowing something to go over the top and, you know, being completely out of place. Is, is that a sense of where they're coming from, perhaps? You know, in, when, when we reviewed this standard with them, they were clear that the intent was really to, to have a number there that would make it so that there's no ambiguity of what the, um, what the height of the hotel could be. So it was to remove that ambiguity, which is more of a quantitative standard to say that 10 feet rather than to maintain the green edge. Uh, that's a qualitative standard and would have to be reviewed from viewpoints. And it was really their intent okay. just to make it uh, easier to measure. Okay, I, I could see that. And sometimes having a number is easier to define than the qualitative that maybe the residents would talk about when they're saying preserve the view when we look up at the Depot Hill. They're not thinking of 10 feet. They're probably just thinking of the green edge and how do you get to the 10 feet. You get to it by trying to preserve the green edge. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and move this to Sean for public comment. Sean? I do see one hand raised. It's Jesse. So I'll go ahead and unmute him. All right, Mr. Bristow, you have three minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening again. Um, so, just wanted to comment, once in stance, uh, that we were in support of Planning Commission's recommendation and. If I recall, you know, at that at that um, hearing, it was pretty much the process is discretionary, anyways. So, planning commission and city council will be able to approve the right product. And um, this objective ten feet that the coastal commission was proposing, and no articulation, and and you know, no flexibility in what could uh, potentially go into that ten feet was was a little unnecessary. Essentially. Coastal is trying to make uh, design the project before having a project to, to be critiqued, uh, essentially. And so, just to um, a little background to, to Councilmember Story's question, we've never uh, proposed anything over the bluff. We've always wanted to keep it um, un under that bluff and be respectful of the homes above. And um, so. Uh, essentially, we, we support planning commission's recommendations in that, and you know we we just want to have the flexibility of it. We don't want to exceed, and we want to be respectful of maintaining that green strip. Um, you know, we've since our conceptual review with planning commission and council, we've reached out you know prior to COVID about um, a, a lower unit count and maybe doing like a four story product. Um, but having that flexibility, you, you're able to still have um, rooms that go from, you know, 9 feet to 10 feet. You know, you, you have less rooms, but they're higher end. And that's something that we were getting positive feedback on. So we just want to have the, the flexibility and not really pigeonhole ourselves to um, this arbitrary number. And so that's uh, those are our comments on, on, the, on the hike there. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bristow. Sean, do we have any other public comments via email or raised hands? No further comments in Zoom. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, I'll go ahead and bring it back. Oh. There are no emails. Thank you, Sean. I'll go ahead and bring it back to Council Deliberation. Do we have any further comments? Oh, wait. I did see a hand pop up at the last second there. Okay. So this is Keith Odo. 
Mr. Otto, you have three minutes. Yeah, so real quick, there was an email that was sent in. I don't know why you did not see it. It was from a resident there that would be adjacent to this property. Um, perhaps you can double check that to, to capture their comments. And then from the, uh, the items that were expressed from the speaker prior, sounds like there was going to be some uh, relaxed language that potentially the council here is going to vote on and it's to produce a product that all will be happy with. Hopefully then if the residents that reside adjacent to this parcel have some objection when that final product is produced and it does not align with some of the items that were discussed here, hopefully there will be an opportunity to place those concerns and adjust the project accordingly. Thank you. I was hoping we could get clarification on a Keith Otto, is that correct, for the record of public participation? Got it. Katie? I just wanted to clarify for the record so it's clear the last speaker's name, and it just popped up as Keith Otto, is that correct, Sean? Yes. Okay, and it would be good as the, when the public makes comment to introduce themselves clearly for the record. Okay, I, I've checked our email again. I, I do not see any emails that have come in. There is a, a second hand that went up at the same time. So I can enable that person to talk. I'll, I'll keep refreshing our email. LA. Okay, Sean, thank you. Um, we see someone in the by LA or Hello. Hi. Sure. I sent an email a little bit. I just didn't make it through. Is there anything being done to address the height of the buildings uh, over on the El Camino Medio side, which would basically be a wall uh, facing these houses, as well as the traffic impact over there? I mean, I'm trying to picture what it would be like. I do own a home there. I'm trying to picture what it would be like both from the bluff and from those homes. And it looks to me like pretty much just a big blank wall. And even the, uh, the two stories uh, along uh, the Esma there along Monterey would, uh, would also be, um, you know, pretty detrimental to that whole, uh, to that whole area. And uh, I just want to point out that. I'm sorry, sir, we cannot hear you. And if you could please give your name. I'm sorry? We lost you for a second. If you can go ahead, um, Jeffy, if you can give him some time to yeah. Yes. Um, uh, addressing the height issue along El Camino Medio, both in regards to uh, uh, blocking and being you know, pretty unsightly on that end, as well as the traffic impact on El Camino Medio, I just want to voice uh, my concerns about those items. Sir, could we get your Thanks. name for the record, please? Sure. My name is Larry Abbott Ball. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Sean, do we have any emails that have come through or anyone else with raised hands? Um, I do not see any further raised hands. I am checking our inbox, I still do not see any messages that have come in. Okay, thank you, Sean. So we'll go ahead and close public comment for now and bring it back to council deliberation. I see council member Story's hand up and then council member Botworth. Council member Story? Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I wanted to begin by responding to um, actually the, the last comment that was made by the speaker uh, concerning the massing of the wall on the uh, video side as well as traffic. Um, and I wanted to, um, you know, let the speaker know that when the design review came up about a year ago, um, 
There were, um, I think, expressions made by council at the time about concerns about, at that time, uh, the project being kind of masked toward the El Camino Medio side and that it needs to, needed to be more balanced. So it spread out the massing over the entire project. And so um, uh, that message has already come up and uh, been sent back to the developer. Uh, as well as issues of traffic, these are things that are going to be studied in the environmental impact reports, um, and uh, and then those impacts will need to be mitigated. Um, so I think that anything that we do tonight um, is not going to uh, affect the public's ability to speak to those issues uh, and to express their desires for maybe um, um, changes uh, in the project at the time. Now, with that said, I'm going to say that I, um, you know, I su support the planning commission's approach to this uh, of not having an arbitrary height limit. Um, just that, again, it gives us more flexibility to uh, develop the right uh, project, taking into consideration many factors. And, and the height just being one, one of them. Um, with that said, though, I would like to, um, um, as part of my motion, recommend that we, in item A, where it says the maximum height of the hotel, and to leave in, including all rooftop architectural elements, such as chimneys, cooplers, et cetera, and all mechanical appurtenances shall be um, well, those other items remain below the elevation of the block. It sounds like that was everybody's intent. Um, and that's, I think that that is, um, um, you know, the top line uh, for me uh, in terms of um, the projections going up over the top of the block. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, make that motion with that amendment to the Planning Commission's uh, Language. I'll second that motion for discussion. Okay, we have a first and a second on the table. Council Member Bosworth. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I pretty much uh, agree with everything Stan said. Uh, I, I believe that uh, when asked, when the Coastal Commission was asked for a number, the number was arbitrary and 10 feet was given up. Uh, the number could, as far as I'm concerned, be five, six, five feet or six feet. But I'd rather not limit us. I'd rather leave it as, as uh, Council Member Story suggested. This is a project that needs to come before the Planning Commission and the Council. It'll be thoroughly vetted. And at that point, you know, the, the restrictions that we all wanted, I think the ones that were important was nothing was to go above the block. And I think it's all about maintaining the green edge. Uh, I do have one concern in here. In, in, the, in the last sentence, in item B, it says, uh, uh, with existing mature trees maintained on site. I really have a problem with the eucalyptus trees that are located. Uh, Katie, if you want to go back to the first picture, I think it shows, kind of gives a picture of the trees uh, adjacent to, not that one. It's, uh, there you go. The trees to the left of the picture that are kind of by the stairway, I don't have a problem with those trees. But we've had problems with the ones behind the apartments uh, up on Grand Avenue. And I'm specifically concerned about the trees from the borderline of the Britannia Arms to the bathrooms. So uh, if, you, if you want to go back to the language, Katie, at the answer that the language says, uh, with existing mature trees maintained on site. Um, I would like to uh, make a friendly amendment to put some language in there that uh, would allow for unsafe trees uh, to be removed. And I don't know, Katie, what kind of language you would prefer to introduce in there. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the idea of maintaining mature trees. But the proximity of those trees, so, so whatever building is going to be there, is a potential hazard. And, and the, uh, the fact that they're not made of eucalyptus trees, I don't really have a problem with uh, their removal. They're not part of any uh, 
butterfly habitat in that location. So that would be my uh, a friendly amendment for a, uh, uh, to uh, Council Member Story. Council Member Story? Yeah, that's acceptable to me. Okay, so the motion remains. Um, I see Council Member Bertrand's hand is raised. Yeah, certainly echo Sam's comments about, excuse me, uh, Ed's comments about the trees. Um, San Francisco, we call those uh, widow makers. They fall in winds and they have very poor roof structures. And so next to a nice new hotel, they're going to cause a problem eventually. Hopefully not too soon, but it's going to be a problem. Um, the Sam's change in uh, Section A, that's sort of a compromise in one sense. Um, I still like the idea of 10 feet, and the reason why is we need to give a strong message to Swenson Builders that the comments we received at the public hearing were taken to heart by the city council. The main comments at that hearing and subsequent discussions that I have with multiple people in the city of Capitola is that it was too massive. You know, with something like 10 feet, that may mean that they'll have to redesign the top floor or eliminate it and get something that is less massive. And I think, I believe Swenson realizes that the pushback from Capitola is to get something that doesn't stand out in such a massive way. They want something that fits in a little bit better. We do want a hotel, but we want something that fits in. And something that has as many floors as they anticipate at this time, and it's if we could go <laughs> up to the line of the bluff, that's what we're going to get, and it's never going to pass, at least if we have people in city council that listen to the people of the city. So, you know, I can't support it as it is. I would prefer the 10 feet to stay in there, so that we could send that clear message to the sons and builders. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Any other council comments? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. Council Member Story on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bertrand? No. Council Member Botorf? Aye. Council Member Story? Aye. Vice Mayor Brooks? Aye. And the mayor is recused. Motion passes. Thank you, Chloe. Okay, I believe that brings that takes us to the end of our agenda. If Mayor Peterson would like to return to close today's meeting. Thank you, Vice Mayor Brooks. Thank you all so much for your participation this evening. Uh, thank you, council members, for this conversation and for staff for all the work that you've put into this. Um, again, we, we really appreciate all the, um, the comments, the public comments. This will conclude tonight's meeting. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan. Goodbye.